worship team for leading us this morning. So back in 1991, the company moved into a new skyscraper and quickly discovered that there weren't enough elevators in the building. Employees were becoming disgruntled over the wait time that they, they had coming to work. They had to wait for an elevator. Leaving work, they had to wait for an elevator. So the, the company got together a cross-section of employees and and asked them, sit down, hey, how are we going to solve this problem together? So they came up with a list of uh, possible solutions. Top four are on the board there. First is, uh, hey, we think what would solve this problem is we should speed up the elevators or arrange them to stop at certain floors uh, during certain rush periods. Somebody else said, no, what we should do is stagger the employees coming and leaving work. Some could come early, some could come a little bit later. That way the elevators don't get, be taken up all at the same time when everyone's trying to get to work at the same time. Somebody else said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to install mirrors around the entrances to all the elevators. Someone else said, hey, what we should do is drive a new elevator shaft right through the middle of the building. Well, the company, uh, they, they looked at all of these different options and they ended up going with number three, strangely enough. And guess what? It worked because what happened was as all of the people were waiting for the elevators, they were distracted by looking at themselves and looking at others through the mirrors. And what they found out was the problem really wasn't so much the lack of elevators. The problem was the impatience of the employees. And nowadays, instead of uh, giving them mirrors, what you just give them is, you know, Fortnite on their phone. And that would occupy them for for hours waiting for an elevator. Uh, So I hear, so I hear. Um, listen, curiously enough, that fascination with themselves has seemed to be the same problem and, and, and not the cure for the people of God. In fact, they had been so blinded by their status as the chosen people of God that they missed the one person, God's own son, who was sent to not only save them, but to save the world from its sin. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it reminds us this salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And that's where our study in Romans chapter 9 has led us to explain why, 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 why have the Jewish people not turned to Christ as their Messiah and And why aren't they being saved? So if you brought your Bible with you this morning, and I hope that you did, I'd invite you to join me in Romans chapter 9 as we take a look at verses 6 through 13 and see how Paul deals with the issue of why the Jewish people have not turned to Christ as Messiah. So this is Paul writing, and here's what he has to say Uh, to us this morning in God's Word. It says this, It is not as though God's Word has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Nor because they are His descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, But it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born uh, or had done anything good or bad... In order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Just like Tom Hanks in the movie Apollo 13. Houston, we have a problem. 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 And the problem that Paul is trying to address is if God truly has saved men, women, boys and girls by grace through faith, if in Christ there is now no condemnation, there is 
Holy Spirit intervention and there is no separation for those who are in Christ, how is it that the promise of God for the Jews has failed? How has this failed? And, and the problem with the problem really is that the Jewish people have missed the Messiah. That's a problem. In fact, it's what has Paul all choked up in Romans chapter 9, verses 2 and 3 that we looked at last week. It says this, I have great sorrow. This is Paul. He says, I got great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. What's caused that, Paul? For I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. What Paul is saying is, look, I wish that I could forfeit my salvation in order that my people, the Jews, might have salvation in Jesus Christ. Of course, it's not possible to forfeit one's salvation. But Paul is saying, I have this anguish in my heart. I, my heart is crushed. My heart is grieved for my own people, the Jews, who have missed the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and the salvation that would come uh, by grace through faith in him. And John would put the problem like this in, in John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. He, that's Jesus, came to that which was his own. Jesus came to that which is his own. What was his own? Well, the people of Israel. He came to the Jewish people. But his own, the Jewish people, did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born by the supernatural intervention of God himself into the lives of men, women, boys, and girls who would receive by faith the gift of salvation. Well, think about it. The Jews had had courtside seats to the supernatural activity of God, and still most of them, even though he was in their midst, midst the Christ. I think about the story found in John 9, 33, about Jesus healing a man born blind. Maybe you remember the story. Jesus uh, took some, some dirt off the ground. He, he spit into it. He made some spittle mud paste, and, and he lathered it on the blind man's eyes. He was born blind. He told the man born blind, go to the, to the river and wash and, and, and when you do, you'll be seen. And, and the man followed the instructions. And indeed, when he washed the mud spittle paste off of his eyes, he was healed. Miraculously so, he was healed. The problem is that Jesus did this miracle on the Sabbath where Jews weren't allowed to do work. And just by the, uh, the, the action of mixing the spittle and the, and the dirt together, he had worked. And so the Pharisees were overcome with with trying to uh, persecute and discredit Jesus, and now he's, he's done work on the Sabbath, even though the work was something unheard of in the history of the world, somebody born blind was healed. Now the Pharisees have this ex-blind guy. They, they have him in their council, and they're grilling him with questions about, hey, what has happened? But really, they don't want to know what happened. They want to tell him what happened. And they said, hey, just admit it, the guy's a sinner, and we'll all go on our happy, merry way. And, and the ex-blind man's going, what, are you guys crazy? Didn't you hear? My eyes were opened by this man. I can't call him a sinner because everybody knows that, that, that a sinner cannot do miracles like this. If this man were not from God, direct quote from 933, he could not do anything. And the Pharisees replied, how dare you? Lecturers, you who are steeped at, in sin at birth, and they threw him out. In other words, God's miraculous activity had settled down in the midst of these Jewish leaders who were longing, looking for a Messiah, wanting a Messiah to come, and there he is in their midst doing these miraculous things, and they could care less. They missed the Messiah. Or how about the raising of Lazarus. You remember the raising of Lazarus, the man who was in the grave for four days? This guy was dead. He was really, really dead. In fact, when Jesus said um, to roll the stone away that, that sealed the tomb, his sister Lazarus, the dead man's sister, she, she said, no, don't do it because by now in King James Version, he stinketh. 
That means decay has already set in. His body is already breaking down. There is a foul odor to be had about my brother Lazarus because he's dead. Did you hear? He's dead. But anyway, they, re- they, they moved the uh, stone and Jesus said the words, Lazarus, come forth. And the man dead for four days rose from the dead, came out of the tomb alive. And the scripture says that many who were there, when they saw the dead man come back to life, At Jesus' word, they believed in him. They believed that Jesus, you see, was the Son of God. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They put their faith in him to save them from their sins. But Scripture also says some of them scurried back to Jerusalem to tell the Pharisees. uh, They said, look, uh, this guy's doing supernatural miracles in the name of God, what are we going to do about him? And the Pharisees said this in John chapter 11, verse 47 and 48, and then 53. They scratched their heads, they looked at each other, and they said, what are we accomplishing? Here's this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. That's the purpose. Except they didn't want to believe in him. What they wanted to do was, so from... That day on, they plotted to kill him. Now, I was just in a classroom of fourth, fifth, and sixth graders for Vacation Bible School. And the Lazarus story was one we told during Vacation Bible School. Great story. And I was telling the story about how Lazarus lumbered from the grave alive. Take the grave clothes off. He's not dead. He's alive. Right? And I was telling the story. And I said, and, and, and here's the tragic part of it. Part of the reason I think Jesus wept. Is because they, Jesus did an unprecedented, never before seen in the world miracle of raising a guy who was dead for four days. And I said, the next thing we know is that the people who saw it, instead of believing what they wanted to do is murder him. When I said that, a little girl who was sitting in the, you know, the class said, what? She couldn't believe it. She never heard the story before. She could not believe that would be the reaction of God stupendously, magnanimously moving with might in the life of Lazarus for the benefit of Israel to see that their Messiah had come, that they might put faith in Jesus Christ. Wow, this is getting animated, right? Okay, very good. I get excited about things like this, right? Because it's all meant to stir our hearts and our souls and and to ask us, have we put our faith in Jesus Christ, this miracle worker, the Son of God. You know, Jesus didn't want it to end like that. Jesus did not want it to play out by people not trusting in him, not putting their faith in him. In fact, listen to what Jesus said in a lament over the city of Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, he, he cried out like this, Jerusalem! Oh, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather you and your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And here's the problem, and you were not willing. Jesus wanted to gather them. He did all these miraculous things to show that indeed he was the son of God. He was going to go to the cross and spill his own blood to provide a remedy for the sin of mankind. And they were not willing to receive him. Now listen, Paul isn't done yet. He identifies the problem. And, and then he gives us the reason. The reason why they weren't ready to receive Messiah. And the reason is this. They mistook being descendants for being adopted children. The Jews, they, they mistook it. They they thought, oh, it's good enough if we just have the DNA of Abraham and, and, and Jesus would tell us and all the scripture would tell us that's not enough. What you need to have is the faith of Abraham. That's what Paul's going to say there in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 9 of Romans. He, he writes, it is not as though God's word has failed for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because, uh, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. They who are not Israel, are they who are Israel, not all Israel. What? 
wait a minute, what are you talking about here, Paul? You see, the Jewish person believed that just by virtue of having Hebrew DNA, the DNA of Abraham, that guaranteed them the promise of eternal life. And Paul's going to say, wait, hold the phone. God's word has not failed. His promises for the nation of Israel are still intact. In fact, they are secured personally through the blood of Jesus Christ. We remember Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. By one sacrifice, that's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he, that is God, has made perfect forever those who are being made holy if we respond in faith to trust Christ. This was God's plan all along. Yahweh Yaira. That is God, my provider. His plan all along was to specifically be the provider of salvation through the blood of his perfect son, Jesus Christ, who was hung up for our hang-ups, a ransom that was given to the kidnapper of sin that might release us for, to be free, to have peace and joy and life. But the way that any man, woman, boy or girl, Jewish or Gentile, could come to the Father would only be by grace. Through faith in Jesus Christ, who is not only the way, the truth, and the life, but he is the only way, truth, and life. In fact, Jesus said it himself, no man can come to the Father except he come through me. Paul puts it bluntly. God's word has not failed. What had happened is the Jewish people had failed to receive the gift that God had provided for the world to give redemption and freedom and life. He says, look, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. In other words, DNA doesn't necessitate their adoption into the forever family of God because that could only happen, as John reminded us in John 1, 12, through faith, by receiving and believing in his name. Abraham's children are not descendants biologically, but they are descendant by having the same faith that Abraham had, saving faith, adopted by God through faith in the sufficiency of the blood of Jesus Christ to save. As Jesus told Nicodemus, you remember Nicodemus, he was a, a Pharisee. He sought to come to Jesus under the cloak of darkness to get some answers to his questions. He had questions. He knew Jesus had answers. And, and he comes to Jesus and, and he asks Jesus, well, well, what about this eternal life? What about this, this kingdom life? And Jesus told him in John chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, he said, you, Nicodemus, must be born again. In other words, your birth as a, as a Jew isn't enough to get you into the kingdom. You must be born again. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Big S, God's supernatural intervention into the lives, into the days of our lives. Flesh gives birth to flesh, Jesus says, but the spirit, you see, gives birth to spirit. So the new birth, the being born again, had nothing to, to do with coming out of your mother's womb. It had everything to do from coming out of the Father's heart of receiving what he has given us in his son, Jesus Christ, as a gift that if we believe it, we would not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is saying, look, Nick, Nick at night, DNA isn't enough. You need a spiritual rebirth to be adopted into the forever family of the Father. That's what Jesus said. John the Baptist wasn't as pleasant as Jesus. Here's what he said to the Jewish people who were coming out into the wilderness. They're coming out into the wilderness to see the freak show, right? It says, locust-licking lunatic out in the, uh, in the desert preaching fire and brimstone. We're going to go see the show. And so they arrived at the show, and here's what John the Baptist had to say to them all. He said, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes. Who told you, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruits in keeping with repentance. 
And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Look, you're all going to need a spiritual rebirth. And what I'm doing out here is proclaiming to make the way straight because the Messiah is coming. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. There's one coming after me who's going to baptize you with fire. The presence of God himself in your life. You need to get ready. You need to get ready. Don't say that we have Abraham as our father and that's all we need. He said, look, the truth is this, that God can raise up children for Abraham out of these stones. It's no big deal for God. You need to get rid of your heart of stone and allow God to give you a heart of flesh so that you'll be ready. And the people are coming, oh yeah, okay. Baptize us so that our heart will be a fertile landing ground for the seed, the truth, the word of God that's going to come, that's going to produce in us repentance so that we can receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's what John had to say. So what is the solution? Paul would state it plainly in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. Ready for the solution? The problem is they didn't, they didn't believe in the Messiah. The solution is this. If you belong to Christ, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Not because you have Hebrew DNA, but regardless of whatever DNA you have, If you belong to Christ, how do you belong to Christ? You put your trust in him. You put your faith in him. You receive him. You believe in his name. That's the solution. You must belong to Christ. And listen very carefully to how you belong to Christ. It entails, it must entail supernatural intervention. It's exactly what Paul refers to in Romans chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. He writes, in other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children. Natural children are the children that come, you know, you, you have children born and, and you do a DNA test on them and shazam, they're yours. You created them. He said, look, the, the natural children are not God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Now, I know this is far reaching, but you already have a history. If you're a Jew, you understand the promise that was given to Abraham regarding Abraham and Sarah having a child. So don't miss it. Paul has just slammed it into high gear and mashed on the the, the pedal to the metal, man. He's going full steam ahead to make his point that God's word has not failed. In in reality, what he's saying is this. If you think that DNA, DNA is enough to propel you forward into the promises of God for joy and peace and life abundant salvation, then ask yourselves, how did that work out for Ishmael? You remember Ishmael? That was Abraham's naturally born son. Maybe you remember the the problem that Abraham was having. He and Sarah couldn't get pregnant. But God had already spoken over Abraham and Sarah's life. He's already said, look, I'm telling you, man, you are going to be the father of many nations. Your descendants are going to be so many that you can't even count them like stars in the sky or sand on the seashore. And Abraham's scratching his head going, and I'm getting old. And I don't even have number one yet. How am I going to have many if I don't even have number one yet? And so Sarah and and Abraham come up with a solution on their own. And the solution on their own is, I'm going to give you Hagar, my handmaiden, Sarah says. And and you can um, uh, conceive with her uh, uh, your heir, your offspring. And so, of course, Abraham did that. and, And Ishmael was the result. And then God came again to Abraham and said, look, I'm going to give you an heir. And Abraham begged, no, let Ishmael be my heir. Let him be the the one who is, you know, the perpetuator of the promise. And God says, no. Why? 
Because the solution is not, cannot, will not ever be one of our own making. It's not going to be by works. The solution must be, has to be, supernatural intervention. And this is what brings God glory. To say it's impossible for you, Abraham, 100, you, Sarah, who 90, to have a kid. In fact, everybody who heard about it laughed. And so they named Isaac Laughter. Right? That's what Isaac means because they're going, this is insane. This is ludicrous. Who's ever heard of a 100-year-old and a 90-year-old having a baby? This must be of God. This must be the promise. And indeed, it was. Did you know that Paul has already documented the outcome of the miracle baby beyond the ability of Abraham and Sarah? He's already documented it in Romans chapter 4. You remember Romans chapter 4. Today is sermon number 55 on Romans, right? So that must have been about sermon, I don't know, 25 or so. So it was a long time ago, like a half a year ago. But, but listen, Paul's already chronicled this journey of faith with Abraham and Sarah and Isaac. In fact, this is how he puts it in Romans 4.13. He says, it is, was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring, that's the people of Israel, received the promise that, would, that he would be heir of the world. It was not through the law. How was it? It was through righteousness that comes how? By faith. Verse 16. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. That's those who will come to Christ through faith. Not only those who are of the law who come by faith, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham He is the father of us all. Who's us all? You and I who don't have Hebrew DNA in our bloodstream, right? We don't, we don't, we're not Hebrews. We didn't get the promise of the Hebrews, but instead we got the promise of God through Jesus Christ. So look, we've been adopted into the family. It doesn't matter who you are. You have a birthright by faith and a righteousness that is imputed uh, to you by Jesus Christ. How did it happen? Verses 19 through 25 tell us, without weakening his faith, that's Abraham, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That is why it is credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who, here it comes, believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for us, for our sins, and was raised to life for our justification. And that's, that's incredible good news. And Paul is saying, look, the Jews missed it. But they didn't have to. And he's wanting to press into you and I who are here today, who are reading this letter, the Holy Spirit wants to press into us. You don't have to miss it. You can also see the Messiah, this, this, the promise of God that is for you, who would believe that you would also be welcomed into the forever family of God, adopted as children, simply by receiving and believing. Now, some of you are thinking, well, that's all fine and good, but what about the rest of it? You know, we read in verses 10, 11, 12, 13 about, you know, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. When are you going to get to that stuff? Well, that's going to be next week because it's too much to try to get in all in one week. It really is. I tried to do it, but I decided this morning not to, and you're all relieved. Well, maybe not. Come back next week. Really, it's, it's good stuff because we've got to answer the question, does God hate? Does God hate? Well, it just said, I have loved e- Jacob. I hated Esau. What does it mean? Well, next week we'll talk about it. But listen, tonight, what, or tonight, <laughs> wow, I've got everything mixed up today. This morning, what we need to understand is that, that, that the lengths that God will go to to pursue us. You know that God pursues us with reckless abandon 
He pursues and he pursues and he pursues. For, for what aim? What, what, what is his desire that you and I might come into a personal relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, who is the remedy, who is the antidote to our sins? He is the one through this one sacrifice and our receiving and believing, we become perfect for how long? Forever. And then he begins working on us to make us holy. He doesn't want us to miss it. And so he pursues, he pursues, he pursues. What lengths does he go to? In the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world. Not just the Hebrews. The Hebrews and the rest of us. God so loved the world that he did what he gave. His one and only son. That whoever, get that, whoever believes in him would not perish. But would have eternal, everlasting life. And the question that we have this morning is, have you believed? Have you believed? Or are you still thinking that you can make perfection by your own efforts? Man, you might be good, but you ain't perfect, baby. You need some supernatural intervention to help you in that regard. You need God to get into the middle of your muddle and to bring salvation to your heart. And, and it's already come in His Son, Jesus Christ. And it's my prayer that this morning the Holy Spirit would lead you to the foot of the cross where you would bow and make your great confession. It's enough. It's enough what you did to save me. And I put my trust this morning in the finished work of your son to buy me back from my sin. I don't care who you are this morning. What's your baker, candlestick maker? God loves you. He's pursuing you. He wants you to say yes to the gift of eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do, I, how do you do that? How do you say yes? You say yes. I trust. I believe. Enter into my life. Guide me for your name's sake. Teach me. And God promises to answer that prayer with a resounding, and you got it. This morning, we come to the place for you to respond. You know, it's curious that in, in our church, we ask you to take a step forward because faith always requires forward movement. And so some people say, why do you get those, you know, crazy baskets in the front? Well, it's so you have an opportunity to come forward, either with your connection card that you could write, hey, this is my response. I want to trust Christ, I, I want to be baptized, I want to join this church family, I want to grow in Christ, whatever your response might need, I just need prayer. And so by coming forward, you're displaying an action of faith, pleases God, by the way. You don't just have to come forward, you, like I said, we got the boxes in the back that you can put them in there, and, and then somebody will contact you and, and help you work through this incredible dynamic of trusting putting your faith in Christ. But listen, this morning you could come to the front. You could come and meet me here and say, look, I, help me to say yes. And we could pray together, right? You could pray and, and I could lead you in that prayer. It's, it's not hard, it's simple, but it requires for you to respond, you see. That's what God is, is looking for in our lives. That's why he sent his son Jesus so that we might hear, that our heart might be stirred by the spirit and we would respond. And so that's what this time is about now. Maybe uh, you've never trusted Christ, and this would be your time. Write it on your card, bring it to the front. You can come see me. You can leave it in the back as you leave. And maybe you say, well, I've already trusted Christ, but I've never followed in believer's baptism. I'm waiting until I, I get my life right. And I would say that's not a New Testament uh, principle. In the New Testament, people put their faith in Christ, and immediately they were baptized. You see, it's the Holy Spirit who's going to make you holy. What God is interested in is in you being obedient. And so you could take a step of faith of being baptized by just saying, hey, I'm, I'm willing. As soon as you trust Christ, you're ready. I'm willing. And then we could set up a time for you to be baptized. We had one just a couple weeks ago. Wasn't it? It was fantastic. 
maybe say, well, I've already trusted Christ. I've already been baptized. But you've been sensing as this world has pressed in on. You know this world is a equal opportunity oppressor. It will oppress you at every turn. We need to be reminded corporately of the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. So maybe this morning what you need to do is to just be reminded. Look, I don't have to journey on this path on my own. The Holy Spirit is, is making straight the path before me. The Word of God is informing me and, and encouraging me to, to stay on that path. And the end is to bring glory to the name of God. Maybe you just need some people to travel with you. You need to be reminded of that. They say, I want to rededicate my life to Christ. And walking in that path, in that vitality, in that victory. Maybe you're here and you just have a, a big concern. Maybe it's a concern for someone, or maybe it's a concern over something. And you want to lay that before the, the feet of the Lord this morning. I'm here to pray with you, to agree with you that God and His grace is sufficient to meet whatever need you have. To tell you and remind you that you're not alone, that there's people who care about you and want to journey with you through this thing called life to encourage you in your faith in Jesus Christ. Whatever you need, this is your time. Would you stand with me? And as we sing, you come as God leads you.